Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with a Victober video. I'm so excited to be saying that. This is actually the first Victober video that I am starting to film because this is going to be a vlog and I am pre-filming by quite a bit. It's still summertime as you can tell by the decor. But I am, as always, just really pumped about Victober, and I just really wanted to get started early this year. And I didn't initially plan to do this vlog, but I'm having some thoughts, and I just feel like this would be kind of an interesting book to do a vlog around. And so in this vlog, I am going to be reading Wilkie Collins's first published novel. My understanding is that this is not necessarily the first book that he wrote, but it is the first book that he got published. And it's called Antonina or The Fall of Rome. This is a historical fiction, which is very unusual for Wilkie Collins and is not something that he did much of in his later career. Wilkie Collins is most known for being a sensation novelist uh, and writing books like The Woman in White or The Moonstone, but this was kind of his first foray into publishing. Wilkie Collins is my favorite Victorian author and every Victober I always plan to like set aside a book of his that I want to read and I feel as though last year I finished up uh, basically I think everything in the line that Oxford publishes and I felt like when that door was closed that I had probably read the best that he had and I've always said Wilkie Collins is not an author that I intended to read everything from. He was incredibly prolific and even people who are massive, massive fans of his will admit that he has more than a few duds and Antonina is often considered one of the worst books that he wrote, if not the worst book. But I kind of have decided that I do want to take the plunge and commit to reading all of his books because I just get so much joy out of reading his writing. And I thought that it might be for the best if I just kind of go from the beginning and we go chronologically. And I thought I might take y'all along with me for this project. So this is the first book that he published. It is historical fiction set in the fifth century in Rome. And this is kind of a pet time period for me, but I have to imagine this is a time period that most people are not all that familiar with, and I think that's probably part of the reason that the book isn't all that popular, uh, is that it's in a very specific time period. Now, I'm really excited about it, and I'm really excited about it basically because it takes place in 408, so a couple of years before uh, the Goths sack Rome in 410. I have no idea why Wilkie Collins wrote this book, why he decided to set it in this time period, because I was trying to do some research into this to give me a little bit more context for where he was in his writing life, what would have inspired him to write something like this, and kind of why he pivoted from something like historical fiction to sensational fiction. There's just not a lot out there on Antonina, and in fact, I struggled to find a copy of it that was in print. And so I wound up with a free ebook version of it, which is doing fine for me so far. I have no complaints, but this is definitely a book of his that I think has become less popular. And so even though I've done some research, I really don't know why he was interested in this time period. It seems like from what I could find, he was kind of fresh off of a trip to Rome where he got inspired to write about it. The plot setup is that our title character, Antonina, is the object of affection for one of the Gothic warriors in Alaric's army. So Alaric was the head of the Goths who sacked Rome in 410. Um, and so I think this is going to be partially a love story. I'm kind of excited by that because I have to say the romance and the couples in most other Wilkie Collins novels are highlights for me in Victorian literature and actually just in classics in general. I really like that Wilkie Collins balances plot and character very well, but I have reached the 10% mark. Uh, and so that's typically when I decide in a Kindle book whether or not I'm going to commit and I'm going to continue reading something. It's around 100 pages in a physical book. I don't know why I think 10% is equal to 100 pages in a physical book because it is not. It's not a book I would outright call bad. Uh, I just think it feels very different from what he did in his later career, which must be what people struggle with. And as with many Victorian novels, our title character, Antonina, has had little to do at this point. She basically has just now been mentioned 10% of the way in. But our first scene, our first chapter, was from the perspective 
of a Gothic woman named Gwisvithna, I think was her name, and the Romans have basically killed her husband and her children, and she is out for revenge on them. And this is already starting out with something that I think Wilkie Collins does very well. So far, her character is easily the most interesting, and I just feel like, whether this was intentional or not, Wilkie Collins wrote very, very compelling female characters. And nearly always in his books, I feel as though I am more interested in the female characters than I am in the male characters. That is not always the case in Victorian literature for me. And it's certainly not always the case with a male writer writing women. And so I feel like he did this very, very well. And I'm already seeing shades of it here in his first book that he just has really given her a lot of respect. And he's talked about the fact that as a goth, she has seen battle. And so she's kind of been like a warrior woman. And so there's definitely time for him to kind of go back on that and insult her for being a warrior, but I just don't feel like he's going to. Again, I don't know whether he really intended to write strong female characters or if it was just kind of unintentional, but I really love it. I love his female characters so much. And so right now I would say I don't consider it a bad book. But I really like this time period. I don't think it's been given enough time to get up off the ground. But I'm going to keep my expectations not low. I'm just going to say that I have tempered my expectations. I'm not going into this expecting another woman in white. Because that's certainly not what the book is trying to be. So update time. I am not 50% of the way through, but I would say I'm about 40% of the way through Antonina. And... <sighs> It's an interesting book. Like I really, at this point, don't see what the complaints about this are. I do see that it is not at all like a typical Wilkie Collins novel or so we think. Uh, and so I can see if you are somebody who is just really into him because of the thriller mystery aspect of his novels. This one is not really going to scratch the same itch. Like this is very much straightforward historical fiction. And as someone who loves historical fiction and who loves the time period that he's talking about, I'm really having a great time. I'm not even going to deny it. Like this is really fun to me on an objective level. Yes, I do think he goes on for too long because he is never going to use a sentence where a paragraph will do. But I think that's kind of the standard with Victorian books. And in fact, I would say if you have read Romola by George Eliot and you enjoyed it, you would probably like Antonina. It is not as densely written as George Eliot's Romola, but I do think in a similar way, it's trying to tackle kind of the same subject matter. In fact, I see similarities between some of the characters. The point that I'm at, Antonina herself has been introduced, and we now actually have had a really good look into the two main villains, uh, which are Goyce Vidna, who I think I mentioned in the first clip, who is a Gothic woman whose uh, husband and children were massacred by the Romans. And so she basically wants all of the Romans to die. She wants them to pay for doing this to her. But we also have Ulpius, I think is his name, we have a guy who is a pagan uh, and who kind of witnessed the death of the pagan religion in his native Alexandria. And historically, that was a very violent time in Alexandrian history. And it's interesting to me that Wilkie Collins chose to talk about it at all. And I feel as though he did it with quite a bit of nuance and also a bit of sympathy towards uh, the pagan people. And so Ulpius wants revenge on the Romans because they have essentially destroyed his religion. And by doing so, they have destroyed all of the people that he knew and loved in his life in Alexandria. And by far, the villains are the most interesting characters. And in fact, they are some of the most interesting characters I've read from Wilkie Collins, which is saying a lot. And I tend to feel this way about his books. I just feel like he writes villains and women very well. And the fact that we have a female villain in this book just really plays to his strengths as a writer. Antonina is a bit of a wet blanket. I kind of assumed that. I assumed she was going to be virtuous to the point of boring because that's the way it tends to go. The other so-called good characters are interesting enough, but I just don't feel an attachment to them yet. 
One thing I have to say that I have just been genuinely laughing at throughout this book is that every time uh, Wilkie Collins introduces another male character, we have to get like this long paragraph about how beautiful they are. Like he literally wants us to know how pretty these men are. That's the main point of this book. And the women get like barely any description compared to this. Like he'll describe what they're wearing and kind of what they look like. But the men, he is talking about like a legitimate K-pop stan. Like talking about, oh, their cheekbones could cut glass. The line of his jaw makes me wish I could write poetry. Like it's literally just drooling over these pretty men. And I'm here for it. I love it. Thank you, Wilkie. This is kind of the information that I want to know about these men. And I think it's funny because Romans and Goths, I think of as uh, supremely masculine, but he has given a lot of feminine traits to the men and describes them almost in feminine terms, in terms of what they look like. But the women are given a little bit of a harder edge and given a little bit more of maybe a darker description, which I just think is interesting. We're also getting into what I'm going to assume is one of the big themes of the book, which is kind of the pagan religion versus Christianity. At this point in time, Christianity has been uh, the main religion of the empire for under a hundred years. And it's very, very interesting. This again is just a fascinating time period. And I think that possibly is why this book is not looked upon favorably because it's a time period that maybe most people are not familiar with and they don't have any context for the historical figures that he makes reference to. Because right now where we're at, Alaric and the Goths uh, are setting up siege outside of Rome. And this is in 408. The sack, the big sack that's done by the Goths is not done until 410. In 408, he does get ransom and he gets money. And he basically goes away and he comes back in 410 and takes over. But Alaric himself is a really, really interesting figure as he is actually a Roman citizen. Uh, a lot of people think of the Goths as just straight up barbarians. By this point, the Goths have been employed by the Roman Empire to do things for them. But Alaric has never been given much respect and he's also just not been given the dues that he deserves after doing certain military campaigns. And so this is kind of a personal thing for him a little bit as well, which is really interesting. In its own way, this book could be about Alaric and it would be a great time. He's also made mention of like Stilicho, who is one of the last of the Romans, one of the last great Roman generals, uh, who is fascinating in his own right. He talks a little bit about Honorius, who was the Roman emperor at the time in the West, who is uh, not a great emperor. Let's just be generous and say that. And on an individual level, all of these historical figures could get their own novel. This is just a great time period because it's bloody and it's personal. And that's what makes for great historical fiction, in my opinion, and also for great historical research. Because every person that I have just named has a personal stake in this. They all know each other just a little bit. And later down the line, you have like Attila and Aetius. Aetius is the Roman general, another of the last Roman generals, and Attila was the Hun. And they knew each other as children and they were friends. And Aetius was a bit of um, a role model to Attila. And then they grew up to become enemies. And Aetius defeated Attila at one of the big battles there in 451. And so each of these events could like be their own novel. So I just really want to read a book now that's about Alaric the Goth. I've always been interested in him. I think he is a very, very fascinating figure. I just would assume there's not much you know about him for sure. I think it's interesting that Wilkie Collins chose this time period and he didn't go for the tried and true Republic turning over to the empire. He didn't go for Augustus or Julius Caesar. He didn't even go for kind of the height of Hadrian or Trajan. And so I think it's interesting that he chose the fall and not even the part of the fall that is the most iconic. Technically, the Western Roman Empire doesn't fall until 476, but the sack in 410 is one of the death blows. So I would have thought if you were going to set it in this time period that you would have set it during the sack 
or leading up to the sack. But I think this is all going to take place here in 408, which is in its own way a success for the Goths, but not the success that the sack of Rome is. The Goths are like obsessed with Rome. They're into Rome and not in a, I want to take this over kind of way. They want to also embody the Roman ideal. They admire like the Senate, the government side of things, which makes it a really interesting kind of handover. But we won't talk about Alaric anymore. I'll also just be quiet about the sack. That can be another video. But uh, suffice to say, I'm really enjoying this. I think the people who don't enjoy this were searching for the typical Wilkie Collins novel. But I mean, on an objective level, I can see the book has a lot of flaws and I can see why people wouldn't enjoy it. But personally, it's hitting a lot of marks for me. Coming to you from a very messy desk area that I'm about to clean up, I promise you. Uh, I am about 75% of the way through Antonina and I'm having a lot of feelings. Some of them are not as positive as the other clips have been. I am getting to the point where I do feel like it's getting tedious. One thing is for sure, the book is too long. Like I think all of the critiques I've seen around it based around the fact that it just goes on and on and on, that is very accurate and I think it is very true. I think for the most part, the length has been justified to me, if only because it is a Victorian novel and I just think it's standard for most Victorian novels to be over 500 pages. I know there are a lot of them that are much shorter than that, but this really does feel long in a way that some longer Victorian novels just don't. I think there's a lot of meat here in the middle that could have been edited down. And I looked it up because I was wondering, just assuming, since again, it is a Victorian novel, I wondered if it was serialized. Apparently it was not. It always came out in one volume. And so to me, the length is just kind of strange. If it was serialized, I think it would make a whole lot more sense. But uh, it is just very long for what it is. I think also the part of it that is described as like the main plot of the book, this romance, I think that's kind of a mistake. I don't think we should be describing the book as a romance because that has really not been the bulk of the book. This is just really straight up historical fiction in my opinion. And I think that makes it a little bit stronger if it was just focused on the romance. I don't know that I would care as much. Sorry for changing the location. I realized that the lighting was getting really weird on my glasses, so I just moved you up a little bit. But uh, this is not to say that I feel like the romance is poorly done. I just don't feel like it's the main part of the book. I don't feel like it's the main plot. And so it's kind of weird to me that the book was ever discussed as a romance. And I guess maybe the romance does fall a little bit because Antonina as a character is just pretty bland and like pretty run-of-the-mill stereotypical Victorian heroine in that she like cries about everything and she's so virtuous and innocent and that's essentially her characterization. I don't really mind that. I'm not someone who really gets bothered by that characterization in classics because I actually think it's refreshing for someone to be just a nice person and get their happy ending and they don't have to be somebody who's like a grand fighter. They don't have to be the smartest person in the room. They just have to be a nice gentle person to have their happy ending. And to me, that's really nice and refreshing most of the time. I just feel as though Antonina is a little bit one note. That is something I will say I have noticed with Wilkie Collins in the past. I feel like he does throw in characters that are like Antonina quite a bit, where they're just like these random sort of one note girls that are basically there for the hero to strive for. I feel like Antonina has a little bit more than say one of the characters in The Woman in White. She's the one that I'm thinking of mainly. But I feel like she does have a little bit more to her and a little bit more to drive her than some of the other characters that I'm thinking of this archetype. I love her love interest though, so much. Of course he is described as like the most beautiful human being that's ever walked the earth. And like, I just had to read a passage about the glistening of his muscles and his armor. And I was like, Wilkie, are you okay? Do we need this level of detail? <laughs>
That leads me into one of my next points because Alaric, who is the king of the Goths, has just had this massive scene where he talks to one of the villainous characters of the novel and uh, he was described like when they walked in to speak to him, it was described as like Alaric sitting on this throne in a tent outside the city. They're like bombarding the city, blockading the city of Rome. So like would he have really brought a throne to sit on? I don't know, maybe he did. But they're describing him sitting on the throne as like this just gorgeous, beautiful blonde man uh, with this shining hair and like these high cheekbones that look like statues. And one time they even described him, I think it was him. If it wasn't him, it was Hermanric as like somebody painted by Rembrandt. Wilkie's descriptions are really getting me this time around. Like, it's just funny to me because, again, I don't think I think of the Goths and the Romans as very pretty people. I think of them as very hard-edged. And so I think it's interesting that he has gone with this, like, really nice and feminine style description of the men. But it's also interesting because Alaric like dehumanizes the Romans in his big speech. He's like, your men are too feminine now to even fill the armor of their ancestors, which makes me wonder about the descriptions and the characterization. Like was Wilkie really criticizing something here about late Roman society or just like late antiquity in general and why we kind of steadily fell downhill into the Middle Ages. I'm very tired of that, but this was written in the Victorian period. So I don't know what I expected. So maybe I'm praising something and I'm enjoying something that is actually him critiquing the society. But Alaric just gave a banging speech about like the oppressed overtaking the oppressors. I love Alaric, King of the Goths. It's time for me to admit it. He's one of my like sentimental faves. I don't know very much about him personally. I don't want to know much about him personally because I feel like I wouldn't like him on a personal level but I feel like he had some really cool lines and this speech that Wilkie gave him was just incredible to me. But 75% of the way through, I don't feel like I can say much for spoilers, but I do wanna talk about this one scene that I feel like is just iconically sensation novel, iconically Wilkie Collins. It's in this scene that I really see kind of the shades of what Wilkie Collins is going to become and it's a banquet of death. So essentially the Goths have blockaded the city of Rome and they are starving them out. So they're kind of creating a famine in the city, waiting to deal with uh, the leaders, the Senate basically. And now it's been going on for so long, people are starting to die. Like people are just laying dead in the streets of Rome. The Senate's having to come out and be like, hey, we'll pay you if you toss bodies over the city walls. And the people are like, money is meaningless because money cannot buy me any food. And so one of these scenes here towards the second half of the book has been a banquet of death where uh, essentially a whole bunch of the Roman Senate get together and decide to eat poisoned food rather than uh, suffer just the hardships of starvation, rather than die like a poor person essentially because their money has been able to buy them food up to this point. Now there's just nothing left. And so they all get together for this banquet of death and everyone reads off this speech. There's poetry read. It is genuinely some of the most decadent and over the top writing I have read in a long time. And I loved it. In many ways, I just feel like Wilkie Collins's writing does fit the Roman period and antiquity in general, because there's just something very over the top about ancient Rome and very, very decadent. And that's definitely what this scene was. And I think it is the scene where I can most clearly see the shades of Wilkie's writing career in the future. And so, I mean, I'm enjoying this. I think it's going to be a strong four stars. In my heart, I know I am not gonna be able to rate it five. I just think it's too long-winded. I think it needs to be cut down. And if it was a tighter story, to be frank, I do think it could get five stars from me. I just really like this time period. And as with every other Wilkie Collins novel that I've read, I have really loved the characters here. And so it's just been very enjoyable for me. And I have to say, I think it is a book that I would enjoy on its own without having kind of the built-in love that I have for Wilkie Collins. I think had I picked this book up on its own, 
I would also just really enjoy this book. But this is definitely one of my pet time periods. And so I recognize that the book has a lot of flaws, but I'm just really enjoying it. The next time that I update you, I think it will probably be when I have finished the book and that very well may be today. Well, I actually did it. I did finish the book about an hour or so after I last updated you, I did finish Antonina and I want to read you the last line of the book. It's not spoilery. He just kind of explains that he doesn't really want to get into the rest of the historical narrative and talk about the sack or anything. He wants to focus on these fictional characters and to him, their story is done. Basically, he wants us to leave this story and leave the walls of Rome while it is still at peace. Here at last, the narrative that we have followed over a dark and stormy track reposes on a tranquil field. And here let us cease to pursue it. So the traveler who traces the course of a river wanders through the day among the rocks and precipices that lead onward from its troubled source. And when the evening is at hand, pauses and rests where the banks are grassy and the stream is smooth. I just thought that was a really dreamy last sentence. And there were a lot of really dreamy passages throughout the book. I have to say on the whole, I feel like this is one of the more beautifully written of Wilkie Collins's novels because he spent a lot of time in the description. And it wasn't always just the basic description of the city so that we could kind of get lost in his descriptions of Rome. I personally would have preferred more of that, but I know that that gets a little heavy handed to people. It's just like people in the 19th century decided to go to Rome and they were like, wow, this is the greatest place ever. And so when they sat down to write books set there, they would like spend so much time at the beginning of the chapter describing the setting and describing the area of the city where the scene is taking place. And I personally eat that up and I prefer it more to the plot. And so, had there been a little bit more of that, I wouldn't have complained, but there was enough of it to satisfy me. I really loved how the book ended. I felt like everything came together and tied together so wonderfully, but again, this is Wilkie Collins, so I kind of should have expected that. Though there wasn't a mystery element here, there were several things that I did feel like I had to figure out, or there were at least several storylines that I was invested in, and it wasn't clear to me how everything was going to come together in the end. So when it did and it came together quite seamlessly, I was really impressed. I'm going to rate the book four stars. I want to say that my kind of initial feedback is that I don't think this is a book that I would ever reread. There are several books of Wilkie Collins's that are high on my reread list. And I don't necessarily know that this will ever figure among them, but there's just something about this one. It was good, but it wasn't great. And again, I think I'm just constantly comparing it to his other novels. And I know that that's what everyone else who reads it must do. And they go into this expecting another Moonstone. And that's just not what the book is trying to be, first of all. But second of all, it is his first novel. And in many ways, I think you can see that it is his first published work. I certainly think that his writing changed quite a bit over his career. And the way that he wrote in this doesn't feel all that similar. For example, this one was just very description heavy. And description heavy on kind of the setting and the historical background, which is not really relevant to a lot of his other works. So maybe he just didn't feel the need to. But this was just very heavy on a lot of description. The characters were described ad nauseum. But in general, I kind of liked that. There was something to the writing of the book that did feel as though it fit very much with kind of the ancient setting. And it harkened back to kind of the classical era of writing. And maybe not specifically the classical era of writing, but maybe more like how people in the Renaissance perceived the classical period. And so there's just like this dreamy elegance to the writing where he's talking about all of these people and the decline of a really wonderful civilization. And so he talks about how people represent everyone who comes before them, but they also represent the decline into what will come after. Again, as a historian who loves the Middle Ages, 
I don't like when people slam the Middle Ages, but there is something utterly beautiful about the language of decay around uh, the fall of the Western Roman Empire that even I can't resist. And so I just think the book was really beautifully written. I really loved the characters. I don't feel as though I've talked a lot about them, but specifically to me, the two villainous characters were easily far and away the most developed, and they were the characters that I was most interested in. Some of the so-called good characters I just felt were a little bit bland or I just didn't care about, but for me there was far more that was enjoyable about the book than there was anything tedious. I do think that middle section should have been trimmed down quite a bit, but that's basically my main complaint about it is that I think the book was a little bit long. I do think this is a hard sell for people just because of the time period in which it is set, and I don't think many people have a general knowledge of what was going on in 408. I even had to go back and refresh myself a little bit because I was wondering about uh, the siege. And so I do think that's possibly the part of it that makes this book a hard sell. It's also just very different from everything else that he wrote. So I would recommend this if you were into Roman historical fiction. And I do think I would recommend it if you were just generally a fan of Wilkie Collins, because I do think it's interesting to see how his writing progressed from his first published work to his last. And I think I am glad personally that I decided to start on this journey and start with the first published, because I really enjoyed this. If this is the one that people say is the worst he ever had, then I'm really excited because I thoroughly enjoyed this. In fact, there are books that other people like more. For example, uh, the Dead Secret. I would rate The Dead Secret under this personally, but I recognize that Antonina was hitting a lot of personal marks for me, and it just was about things that really interest me personally, and so I think it was a book that I was always going to jive with, but I'm really glad that I read it, and I really had fun reading it. I read it in four days, so it's fun to have read a book that I was so engaged in that I wanted to just read, read, read. And that was definitely the case here. So I rated this four stars and frankly, I loved it. So that is the first Victober video that I have filmed so far this year done. I don't know when you will see this in the month, but I would love to know if you have read this down below or if you've ever heard of it. I think it's a really interesting one and I'm kind of sad that more people don't talk about it, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Happy Victober. Goodbye.